Hi everyone, welcome. Um, I know it's uh, we're still here uh, physically distanced, but you know socially connecting here, and hopefully you and your families are all doing well um, and had a good holiday season. And we're going into December, so uh, holidays around the world are coming up. So I think it's rather time when we had uh, someone motivating us to do exercise last week, and we have um, an amazing uh, speaker today, Carly Rush from uh, the University of Florida. She uh, trained there largely and has been there and is getting her uh, doctorate there um, and works with uh, the fabulous Dr. Oaken and his team. And so we're excited to have him, um, her, her join us today and, and his uh, lovely multidisciplinary team has just been fabulous throughout these series. So, so we're excited to have uh, uh, you, Carly, joining us from Florida. Um, welcome. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming, um, you know, a, a I guess it's, it's a dietitian who focuses on nutrition and Parkinson's. I know you also work in the gut microbiome a little bit and some other things. So, so perhaps we can learn a little bit about your journey and uh, you can update us on um, how, how it is that one becomes exactly your um, uh, specialty as well um, and sort of the research um, area that you're focusing in is, would be great. Perfect. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's really exciting to be here. There's, I think there's over 200 people signed on, so that's really that's really amazing. Um, so a little bit about me um, and my journey and how I'm, I, I am where I'm at. Um, so I did, like you said, I did most of my education at the University of Florida. Um, originally, I thought I wanted to be a, a doctor, a physician. Um, just I've always been interested in healthcare and being a healthcare provider. Um, it really wasn't until I uh, got to college and I started preparing foods on my own uh, that I realized how important food and nutrition was, and I started learning more about it in just some of my undergraduate classes, and um, that kind of sparked my interest into becoming a dietitian because I realized, oh, wow, I can really specialize in this area and really help people with the foods that they eat and with nutrition, too. So um, I did my, uh, di my bachelor's and as well as my master's in dietetic internship here at UF. After that, uh, well, actually, while I was um, through both those programs, I was really involved actually with research. Um, the lab that I joined as just like a volunteer originally did a lot of studies with healthy people um, looking at probiotics, prebiotics, and the microbiome and how that could influence gut health and immune function. And from there, I really developed an interest in gut health and immune health too with pro and prebiotics. Uh, and uh, after I became a dietitian, I actually ended up working in oncology and cancer. Um, it really wasn't after, until after a couple of years. Um, I really enjoyed my job there, but I received a phone call from my former um, advisor in the lab that I worked in, who's a professor here at UF, and she said, um, we just were notified from the neurology department, so Dr. Oaken, that they had received um, a generous gift from donors and they really wanted to invest that money into bringing a dietitian on their team. And not only did they want a dietitian, but they realized that there's a lot of gap in the literature with neurological diseases and nutrition, specifically with Parkinson's. And they really wanted a dietitian who also wanted to pursue research too. So that's where this combined um, PhD program kind of came about. It was basically just created from the generosity of donors. Uh, and so now my research, I get to kind of combine um, my previous love for gut health and now my new love for Parkinson's because we know that um, people with Parkinson's do have a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms that um, is pretty common actually. So now that's my research is looking at particularly the Mediterranean diet and how that influ how that might help constipation symptoms and Parkinson's. And then, you know, in my spare time, because I have so much of it, I work as a dietitian part-time in the clinic too at the Fixel Institute here in Gainesville. So they're keeping me busy. <laughs> Amazing. 
Well, so much enthusiasm. I know we spoke a little bit before and it's just, it is a very hot area. I know patients have a lot of questions in this area and a lot of the doctors don't know too much about how to, you know, advise people in an informed way. So we're so excited to have you with us today to share, um, you know, sort of how to uh, approach this topic. And um, I think it's a, lot, a rather large topic as we spoke about. So we're going to focus a little bit and then we'll take some questions and we'll have a discussion um, afterwards. But I know you prepared some slides and uh, we'll, we'll let you share them with us. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yes, I'll go ahead and share those. All right. You guys can see my slides. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All righty. So I know I talked a lot about how my interest is in gut health and immune function and Parkinson's, but I'm really going to keep the purposes of my talk actually more general. Um, if people have more specific questions about that towards the end, I will be gladly happy to answer any of those. But um, so basically the purpose of this presentation I'm going to give is to really just discuss, get down to the basic. Let's just talk about the basics of nutrition and how poor diet can really impact people with Parkinson's. I also want to talk about some healthy eating strategies that we can probably implement as part of our daily routine. I know we're all coming off of Thanksgiving, all the turkey, the stuffing, the sweet potato casserole. Um, so, you know, maybe you might not be ready for all these strategies right now, but I know the new year is coming up and we all get really excited about new um, healthy eating behaviors then. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about too, just um, touch on some the relationship of meal timing and how um, food interacts with certain Parkinson's medications too, because I, that's something that I really commonly talk about in clinic that I think could be helpful for everyone listening today. I already told you a little bit about me, so this is just kind of like a pictorial description, but just to show you some photos. So essentially, I split my time between lab work, which you can see here on the left, and then clinic work, which you can see here on the right too. Um, and I really, I, I never thought that when I joined this program that if I ever got a PhD, I would get to combine both the clinical and the research aspect as part of the whole program. And so I'm really happy that I get to do it here um, at the Fixel Institute in Gainesville. Um, and the next thing I just wanna talk about is just tell you what is a registered dietitian. Often, uh, a lot of patients have ne that I speak with have never talked to a dietitian before. They might've heard of one. They don't really know exactly what they are. So essentially who we are, are food and nutrition experts who have completed a, at minimum a bachelor's degree um, and supervised practice hours from a, an accredited internship program. We've also passed a national exam and we have to continue completing continuing education to maintain our registration. And you'll see dietitians actually practice in a variety of settings that usually mostly is in hospitals and other healthcare facilities like where I'm working in the outpatient clinic, but you'll also find them um, sports nutrition, corporate wellness programs, private practice, food industry, community public health settings, universities, and research too. But the biggest question that I get from people is, what is the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? Because you might see different terms kind of thrown around out there. But essentially kind of what it boils down to is all dietitians are nutritionists but not all nutritionists are necessarily dietitians. The term nutritionist is more of kind of a blanket term. There's no uh, laws or regulations for who can call themselves a nutritionist. So um, basically a dietitian is more of a um, uh, accredited term for uh, food and nutrition experts. Doesn't mean that we're the only food and nutrition experts. There's plenty of others out there um, with practicing within their own fields, but um, this is just kind of give you a summary of a dietitian. And I know the title of our talk is Strategies from a Neurology Dietitian. So some of you, you might, I get the question also often, what is a neurology dietitian? Well, there's really no formal definition. I kind of just, Dr. Oaken and I decided just to come up with it on our own because I think it really better defined what I do. So essentially my definition of a neurology dietitian is really a registered dietitian that works directly with individuals who are either at risk or diagnosed with a neurological disease or condition. And this could, all, this could be in a variety of settings. And just to kind of, I liked um, Allie's little bubbles that she had at the, the top that last time with the um, physical therapy. So just to kind of give like some blurbs about just some things that I do in the clinic, I treat poor appetite, a lot of people have unintentional weight loss, obesity, um, I do food drug interactions, diet education, 
I work with people who have difficulty chewing or swallowing, dysphagia, vitamin or mineral deficiencies, and also just other, um, just using counseling strategies too to develop healthy eating behaviors. So now just to kind of like bring it back to some basics of nutrition and Parkinson's. So when, I, when I'm talking about the term nutrition, what that means is the process of providing or obtaining the food necessary for health and growth. So it also can refer to the branch of science as something that I'm studying that studies how nutrients and food impact health and metabolism. And then we hear the term diet and that just refers to the kinds of foods that a person or even an animal or community habitually eats on a regular basis. And just to kind of like break down some of those keywords that you might hear within the nutrition and health space. So we have um, different nutrients and food components that kind of be, can be grouped together. So the first thing that we have are our macronutrients or these are um, going to be groups of um, nutrients that provide calories. And this is what a calorie means, it's just a source of energy that is produced for our body to function. So it often can be referred to as metabolism in some ways. And so the three main macronutrients are gonna be your proteins, carbohydrates, as well as fats. Then we have our micronutrients. So what micronutrients are is they provide little to no energy like in the form of a calorie, but they are essential building blocks for our metabolism. So, and um, vitamins and minerals would often fall under these micronutrients. Um, I know when we think about vitamins and minerals, we often think of supplements, but really these are found in the variety of foods that we eat. Then there are some other food components that can be found um, in our diets. And that are, these are components that could be beneficial to health. So dietary fiber um, is particularly what my research is focused on, um, is basically what this is, is just non-digestible forms of carbohydrates that, can, that are good for um, our gut function, as well as our immune function, um, even satiety as well. And then we have other phytonutrients. This can kind of, this is more of a broad term that can refer to um, things like antioxidants, which are good for um, fighting inflammation within our body. And so just to kind of like bring it back to Parkinson's and just how does nutrition and the food we eat impact Parkinson's? So whenever I talk about nutrition, I kind of like to refer it to the fuel for our body to function. Sometimes I often refer to it as like a car. If our body is a car, we have to put gas in it. We need to give it a good oil change, a little tune up every once in a while. And food and nutrition can really act um, as that for our bodies to function. And we know when it comes to Parkinson's, a poor diet can lead to fatigue, um, just from not getting good sources of energy, uh, malnutrition or obesity, GI dysfunction like constipation, which is the focus of my research. I, um, and I know when we think about nutrition, we think a lot about food, but I always like to bring it back to the, the drinks and the liquids that we eat are also a part of a healthy diet. And um, often I find that a lot of people in practice can be dehydrated or just not getting enough fluid in their diet. And um, we also know that overall, a poor diet could lead to reduced quality of life, as well as possibly increased severity of par Parkinson's symptoms, whether that's motor or non-motor, as well as increased risk of other chronic diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, et cetera. And kind of like I alluded to in the beginning, um, there are some other considerations that we want to think about with Parkinson's and foods. And that mainly is how potentially foods and drugs could interact too. And just to kind of like bring it back to a more general sense, um, often I um, like to use this plate method as a visual because people, um, I think we try to sometimes overcomplicate healthy eating. And so I think um, thinking about what does a healthy plate look like can be a really great example. I really like um, the Harvard, um, their School of Public Health and Medical School developed this healthy eating plate diagram. And I think it's a really great visual representation of how we can build our plate. And what I like about it too is that uh, this is not saying what specific 
foods that you necessarily need to eat every single day. Really building a healthy plate is adaptable to your own personal preferences and needs. Just because you don't like broccoli, you can. there's plenty of other vegetables that you can fill your plate up with, right? Maybe you like asparagus or Brussels sprouts. Um, and then um, I like to, and with this, it's just showing uh, to use the following structure. So filling up half your plates with fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate whole grains, another quarter of your plate from lean proteins. Lean protein foods are gonna be foods such as like fish, poultry, beans, nuts, and really trying to limit red meat and cheese um, and other processed meats too. What the other thing I like about it, um, like I mentioned before, is they put the glass of water on this visual. So drinking plenty of water throughout the day is going to be really um, beneficial to our health and really trying to limit sugar sweetened beverages, juices, etc. They also have um, healthy oils on here as well, like olive oil, canola oil. Um, I really like avocado oil too, that's not mentioned on here. Um, and then I put on my slides too for you, just some other um, tips and resources for healthy eating. The uh, USDA My Plate is another uh, plate visualization and they have a plethora of recipes and figures and um, just basic nutrition info that's really, really good on their website. So I've linked it here on these slides for you. But when it comes to nutrition and healthy eating, often I really find it all comes down to just creating a nutrition game plan. So that's part of what I wanted to talk about was just five ways that you can really improve your nutrition game plan at home. So the first one is going to be pick one day of the week to create your plan. So just Think about your week ahead. Do you have, I, right now with the pandemic, I don't know how many events you have, but do you have obligations with family, work, et cetera, right? What days are those happening? And then think about what days are easier to shop and prepare meals at home. And this doesn't have to be delegated to one day of the week. It could really be broken up into different days, just depending on what your schedule looks like. And then I also, you know, whenever you're planning this out, I want you to think about what types of foods or recipes do you enjoy? Um, sometimes I have people who do struggle with fatigue um, or just poor appetite. I find that keeping a list of favorite foods in the kitchen is a really helpful way just to, if you ever feel um, just tired and just don't really know what to cook, you're staring at the refrigerator like, what do I do? Referring back to that list can be um, really helpful to like trigger you like, oh yeah, I really like chili. That could be something easy I make tonight. And then um, another um, great way to plan your meals too is um, depending on where you shop, often there are weekly sales, savings, coupons, so try to plan your meals and the foods that you're eating during the week around those sales to, um, for a more budget-friendly option. Because I know a big complaint from people is that they feel that healthy eating is expensive. And so this is one way to kind of cut costs too. The second would be is once you've kind of developed this game, developed this plan, you've sat down and you're ready to go, now it's time to really make a grocery list and stick to it. Um, and this can be really fun too. So I, I talked about creating a favorite foods list, but that you can also look up new recipes online or use old cookbooks. Uh, I know a lot of people, there's a lot of blogs nowadays where if you just typed in chicken recipes on Google, you will find a number of different things. And then the next thing that you would wanna do is really double check the items you need with the items you already have, just to make sure you're not double buying something. Another helpful tip is just keeping some basic food staples in your pantry. So this could be whole grains, whether that's like whole grain rice or, or oats, nuts, extra virgin olive oil, herbs and spices. And then if there are certain foods that you do eat more of um, and there is a bulk purchasing option at your grocery store, buying in bulk could also be a great cost savings way. The third is going to be um, taking a look at those recipes and foods that you like and just seeing um, how long 
those servings are going to last you. Maybe you need to double the recipe to feed your family or even triple. Um, and that way you can eat it throughout the week. Or if you're not really a leftover person, then maybe just freeze it for later too. What I really like to do is use something like meal prep containers. I have a little picture of it here. These are really great um, because that way, once you've prepared a meal, you can pre-portion out these foods into the individual containers. And that way you can just pull it out of the fridge, heat it up in the microwave or on the stove and you're ready to go. Most of these containers can be found at most local retailers and even online from Amazon, Walmart, and most grocery stores too. And then I really like to utilize freezing foods to just kind of help make things last. And so that way you have some um, recipes kind of in your back pocket for some of those days where you don't feel like cooking. Uh, chilies, soups, even fresh fruit and vegetables you can freeze to really decrease um, the time you spend in the kitchen during other weeks. And number four is going to be really power up your plate with fiber. I've, I've talked about fiber quite a few times and I probably won't stop talking about it. Fiber is like the golden child in my book because it really can help with promoting bowel regularity like constipation um, or improving constipation. Um, and certain fibers can help promote satiety and even regulate cholesterol and blood sugar levels like fiber that comes from oats. And when it comes to fiber, um, in general, I often just try to recommend to eat a variety of fiber-rich foods. So there's not one specific food that's perfect. Um, while I think a variety of foods in the diet is much better. So this could come from fruits, vegetables, legumes, peas, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And when needed, some people really might need to utilize fiber supplements too. And I think working with your doctor and or a dietitian to, um, is best to really find the right one because there's different fiber supplements that you'll see on the market and some might not be as beneficial for you um, than others. So um, for example, fiber can get a little bit more complicated between soluble and insoluble. So Benefiber, which is a common supplement you'll see is a soluble fiber. Citrus cell is a different one, which is an insoluble fiber. So it's often best to work with your doctor or a dietitian just to figure out which one would, would be best. And the last one is gonna be, uh, I, I'm not saying that you have to cook at home every single day of the week and only eat home cooked meals. I know that we live in a very fast paced society. Um, and even though we might be home more for the pandemic, we still might wanna eat out. So when it comes to eating out, really try to create more discipline for yourself and look up healthy options at your favorite fast food or restaurant. Do they have grilled or baked, baked options available? You can choose a side of fruit or a garden salad over fries. Um, and then take that plate method into account too. Really try to fill up half your plate with vegetables. And if you're going somewhere, maybe it's like an olive garden or even a cheesecake factory where they have these really huge, large portions, maybe you split half the entree with someone or take the, uh, or take the other half home and eat it for later too. So just to kind of give you like a visual representation, um, Chick-fil-A is a very big fast food restaurant in Florida. Um, it's not all, all over the US, but it's pretty popular here. So, you know, instead of getting your fried nuggets and fries, maybe you try one day getting some grilled nuggets and a salad. And when it comes to eating out at fast food or restaurants, I don't expect you to eat perfect healthy and make all the right healthy options. So sometimes healthy eating for you might just be choosing the fried nuggets, but instead of having fries, maybe having a salad instead. So really just creating more discipline for yourself saying, you know, the fries are always going to be there. Maybe let's just try a salad today and just see how it tastes. And I know I talked about um, creating like a plan for you and planning meals out of the week. So this is just kind of a visual representation. Uh, it doesn't, for you, it might not need to be this specific, but just to kind of give you an idea of something that I utilize, I like to just um, write, you could do this on pen and paper, even um, on the, like an Excel sheet too. Just writing out the days of the week. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then breakfast, lunch, snacks, dinner. And just sitting down and saying, okay, for breakfast, I know I really like to have eggs and toast and maybe some mashed avocado 
right? And then I know I'm gonna, uh, I with work, we're gonna eat out with Susie um, and order takeout. So maybe I'm gonna have lunch out here. And then for dinner tonight, I know I'm gonna be really busy. So maybe I'll just pick up a rotisserie chicken and just roast some vegetables and call it a day. And then with planning out these meals and how many servings they provide, you can really start to plan, okay, can I have leftovers for lunch the next day and maybe the following day if you want to push it out to the second day and just kind of take this through the rest of the week. And so for some people, this might be a little too ambitious to start off with. You don't have to plan out your whole week. Maybe it's just starting off with, okay, Monday through Thursday, let me just tackle those days of the week to really try to plan out my meals and the foods that I'm going to eat. So it's really gonna vary based on the person. And there's really no perfect way to do this, but I think really just sitting down and creating that plan for yourself will really help making adopting these healthy eating behaviors a lot easier. Um, and just to kind of switch gears too, so we talked about just in general, healthy eating and planning, but what about if you're on a certain medication that might interact with the foods that you are eating? How do you work around that? So we know a common medication with Parkinson's is going to be that Cinemet or Carbidopa Levodopa. And essentially what we're trying to treat is a loss of dopamine neurons in the brain. So Levodopa, that portion of Cinemet, helps us make more dopamine. And carbidopa just helps improve the absorption of levodopa. And when it comes to um, this medication, often in support groups and clinics, um, one of the most common things I hear it, and I work with people about is um, that dietary proteins um, can be a uh, main food drug interaction with this medication. And this is because proteins might compete with levodopa for absorption in the gut and possibly even the brain too. In some people, this might lead to delayed on time and early wearing off. However, in practice, uh, this isn't always the case for everyone. So sometimes I get someone who is newly diagnosed and they're like, okay, do I have to eat like a completely avoid protein now that I'm on this medication? And the answer is no. Well, the answer is generally no for everyone. But in general, most research has um, demonstrated that we really primarily see this happen after someone's about 10 years after someone's been diagnosed with Parkinson's. So a lot of um, those early um, onset, early onset or early stages of the disease, we don't necessarily see these large interactions with the medication. So like I alluded to, in practice, protein sentiment interactions really occur on a large spectrum. So just to give you kind of some examples, so I have patient one recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. They take cinnamon with their meals three times a day. They have pretty good on time 30 minutes after, no issue. Then I might see patient two. Maybe they've had Parkinson's for about six years and they take they need to take their cinnamon 30 minutes before their meals about four, uh, four times a day, but they still get pretty good on time afterwards. And then I might have someone um, like patient three, where maybe they have been living with Parkinson's for quite, quite a while. And it really does take um, about 60 minutes, sometimes even longer for their medication to really kick on to, um, depending on the time of day that they eat it with their meal. So this is just kind of just to show you that not everyone responds the same way when they eat when they and when they take their medication. And we think about, we talk about protein a lot, but I think one of the things that's really missed out on is there's also other potential food interactions with cinnamon. So for example, um, if we have delayed stomach emptying, so, uh, then we have delayed or decreased absorption of that medication. So if we think about like our stomach here, it needs to empty out into our intestines and that's where that medication is going to be absorbed. So if that stomach is uh, delayed and how quickly it empties, that medication isn't gonna get absorbed as quickly as others. And we, we do know that 
delayed stomach emptying can be a symptom of Parkinson's, but there's also nutrients that could also delay stomach emptying. And that is proteins, but not, all, not only proteins, it's also fats and some dietary fibers too. So um, I, I remember I spoke at a symposium and I, one of the questions I had from someone was, why is it every single time after I go to Carabas and I eat a big meal, my medication doesn't work as effectively? And that's because um, that large meal probably had a lot of protein, fats, and just overall their stomach was delayed how quickly it emptied. And that was more of an explanation of why their medication didn't work as effective. Not necessarily the protein by itself, but more so the whole, the whole meal as a whole was too large for them. So just, if I'm just gonna give some general recommendations, overall, it's generally recommended to take cinnamon on an empty stomach. 30 minutes before meals, or one to two hours after a meal. However, this might need to be adjusted um, as needed, just depending on the effectiveness and also just someone's preferred schedule too. And that's something that I work with one-on-one -on -one with people in clinic is how can we develop a eating schedule along with their medication schedule too. Um, and then just keep in mind, some people can tolerate their medication with food, others might need more time fasted. And just always keep in mind, everyone's different. Just because you hear uh, Mr. Smith has to do it this way doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do it that way too. And when it comes to uh, meal timing and cinema, I do have, I do work with some people who are more sensitive to how cinema affects them, um, particularly nausea, um, that's really common. Um, that I see in clinic with people. So if this, if this is a symptom that you experience if you take cinnamon on an empty stomach, one of the um, main recommendations I give someone is to pair their medication with a simple carbohydrate. So what a simple carbohydrate is, essentially it's just a quickly digested um, carbohydrate and it's really less likely to delay that stomach emptying. And so just some examples would be juice, um, that, a soda or ginger ale, white bread, crackers. I'm not saying have a full glass of juice, but maybe just like half a cup or just a slice of bread or a couple crackers just to kind of coat the stomach, not create um, fullness, but just to get, get something on your stomach. So maybe it'll help ease that nausea. There's also other strategies for people who are particularly more sensitive, um, more so in later stages or people who have been um, dealing with um, Parkinson's for a while, is a protein redistribution diet. So what this type of diet is essentially is the greatest amount of protein that you eat is just shifted to the time of day when the interaction is the lowest. So that's particularly at night. So instead of eating um, small or equal amounts of protein throughout the day, maybe having a low protein breakfast and then a higher protein dinner is how a protein redistribution diet would be structured. But again, I really think it's important that if this is something that you do struggle with, to meet with your doctor and or a registered dietitian to come up with a more tailored approach to meet your needs. These are just general recommendations and what you experience at home might be different. And the other reason why it's important to work with a healthcare provider on this is that often I get people who might just be completely scared of protein and food and not eating enough protein and calories can really increase your risk of developing malnutrition, which can ultimately um, increase the severity of your symptoms and just decrease your quality of life too. Um, and then just some other medications that we might want to keep in mind that people might be on, um, like Mirapex or Nupro, Requip. These don't interact with dietary protein, so you don't need to worry about food, food drug interactions there. There's no really specific dietary restrictions. And Side effects may impact if you take it with or with foods. It just depends on the person and what works best for you. Then there's some other groups of uh, medications people might be on, which are MAOB inhibitors. These don't interact with most dietary proteins. However, 
they might um, increase the dietary compound called tyramine. Um, what that is, is just tyramine, if it's in really high levels, it could increase our blood pressure if consumed in really large amounts. And so um, if you're on this type of medication, it might be best to avoid certain high tyramine foods such as alcohol, aged cheeses, cured or fermented foods, and soybean products. Um, but I will say, you really have to eat or drink a lot of these foods to really have an effect on your blood pressure, but just something to keep in mind. So in conclusion, overall, Nutrition acts as the fuel for our bodies to function. Building a healthy plate is adaptable to your own personal preferences and needs. Creating a nutrition game plan can really help make choosing healthy options easier to incorporate into your diet. And people with Parkinson's may need to monitor potential food drug interactions with their medications too. And it's really important to ask your doctor and or a dietitian for help when needed. And then with that, we can take it for the Q&A. Thank you so much. That was great, Carly. You have a lot of questions here. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You, you stopped sharing screens. So that's amazing. So I will, I'll man the chat. Don't worry about it. Just um, uh, so there's a few questions, uh, maybe just starting with um, sort of slow gut motility and, um, you know, sort of the gut slows down. What are your main sort of recommendations when people have a feeling that it takes, you know, a long time for, for their gut to process their food? Are there a couple of key, key thoughts? Yeah, so um, definitely avoiding, tr um, trying to limit foods that might delay how quickly our stomach empties, um, particularly um, dietary fats um, and like fried food, processed foods, those really can, and just large meals in general can slow how quickly our stomach digests. So if you do struggle with slow um, or gastroparesis or delayed stomach emptying. Um, often the recommendation is smaller, more regular meals throughout the day um, and, a and a lower fat diet. Okay, that's great. Um, there's a question about, um, so there's been sort of a, a question of, about sort of the, the recommended diet in general and also the specific um, issue about dairy, because I think, you know, people, I think most of us agree that, you know, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, nuts, healthy things, fiber, all make sense. Um, you know, I think some people have gone, you know, John Duda, for example, thinks that veganism is the best way and no dairy at all. Uh, Lori Michelin, I know, talks about lack, um, sort of avoiding dairy um, in certain cases. Uh, so maybe you could speak to sort of what you advise on a practical level about dairy. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to dairy, uh, there's been a lot of evidence on risk of Parkinson's. And if you have a high dairy consumption, it might increase your risk, uh, particularly when you kind of look at when you get fine tuned into the specific types of dairy. It does, it seems it's more milk and milk products versus, or not milk products, sorry, just milk in general versus cheeses and yogurts. Um, so there may be something there. There, I know Lori Mishley had talked about um, in her practice, she does track um, people with Parkinson's and their dairy intake and how their symptoms progress. Um, I, I don't think the, the research has really give, given us a final say yet. I think. Um, so I, what I would recommend is if you do enjoy dairy in your diet, really trying to not make it, make it the focus of your diet if, and just trying to limit it to one to two servings and mostly from um, cheeses, yogurts, and maybe um, less milk product, dairy, like cow's milk throughout the day. And is there any um, support of like organic milk versus other? Yeah, um, I know there's more people studying um, how like organic or the way milk is processed might influence our risk for like certain cancers and, and possibly Parkinson's. I, I don't think we have an answer there yet. Um, and often I find when we when we talk about like organic versus not organic, I always say just to buy whatever's in your budget. You know, I mean, if you prefer to um, organic milk, then great. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, but I, I still think you can get uh, um, incorporate a non-organic dairy as part of a healthy diet. 
Sounds good. Um, I think some folks are asking about alcohol. What's your uh, sort of suggestion on the alcohol front? So, uh, wine, for example, specifically. Five, yeah. So uh, the Mediterranean diet, since that's the focus of my research, um, wine is recommended um, as a form of for brain health, just be, uh, at, because former studies have found that red wine consumption might help with improving memory or cognitive function. Um, I, I, I still think it's a, it's a very loose recommendation. So when it comes to alcohol, I don't recommend starting to drink if you are not a drinker, <laughs> just because we know that that might in, um, just increase our risk for like cancers and other chronic diseases. Um, but if you are, if you do drink alcohol, preferably to drink red wine and really when it, and really limit those servings of alcohol is going to be beneficial for our health. So a serving of alcohol would be a five ounce glass of wine. So uh, one cup is eight ounces. So actually a little bit less than eight ounces. Men get, get a little bit, get away with a little bit more. They can have up to two servings of alcohol a day. Women, the recommendation is one. Um, when it comes to wine, I like to tell people measure out the amount of the five ounces in a measuring cup and then pour it into your wine glass. Cause I know we all have like those really big wine glasses. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And then that way you can get a really good visual like, oh, okay, this is how much five ounces is and really um, take your time and enjoy it too. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, so there's also a question about, um, so if you're eating things like apricots or prunes and things for, for constipation improvement, when's the best time to take it? Is it, you know, with the meal, before the meal, after, in the morning, evening, what, what's your recommendation on that? Um, unless you struggle with like with, with poor appetite or um, stomach emptying issues, I would say any time of the day is perfect to take it. As long as you, whenever you remember to take it regularly, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there's a question or two about weight loss. Um, and one is whether dyskinesia causes weight loss, which I can tell you that it does, but also what do you recommend, you know, for um, patients who are losing weight um, in terms of your sort of ways to supplement? Yeah, so you're right. Yeah, dyskinesia definitely can induce weight loss just because if we think about it, extra movements equal extra energy expenditure. And so when it comes to maintaining our weight, if we want to maintain our weight, we want the foods that we eat to match the energy that we're expending. And often people who have dyskinesias are expending way more energy from their movements than what they're able to eat. So usually what I recommend is, um, number one, are the dyskinesias being induced by like a food or a, a protein cinema interaction and trying to kind of um, find, get more details there and fine tune there and try to maybe uh, move the protein around and see if my, that might help reduce the dyskinesias. That doesn't always work. Often what I find is really um, supplementing with a high protein, high calorie diet um, is the best way. Sometimes you kind of have to figure out the bliss point for the protein because we know that too much might make the dyskinesias worse. Um, but when it, if you can time it right, with meals and get in also just getting more calories in that can really help. So um, what I find if you're someone that has just terrible dyskinesias and you just poor appetite and you just really can barely eat throughout the day, there is a supplement um, and you can find it on Amazon. It's called Bena Calorie. And what's great about it is that it's a gel. It's like a little gel and it's about one and a half ounces. And it's about 330 calories and only seven grams of protein per serving. And, and it comes on flavored too. So you can add it to smoothies, yogurt, oatmeal, um, and just often just supplementing that one time a day can really help possibly stabilize someone's weight too. And then we talk about other um, high calorie, healthy sources of foods like healthy oils um, and avocado is a great way to add calories to meals. So, and then it's just working with the um, interdisciplinary team too, because often, um, you know, there's only so much I can do with nutrition and really we need to optimize the um, 
th the therapeutic strategy, and that might mean um, other changing up the medications and other considerations too. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I think that's a great thing um, to recommend. I've, I actually hadn't heard about that. That's that's a good good tip. A um, few other things. There's lots and lots of like 22 messages. I'm like, whoa, um, that that are like coming in now. So I, I'm kind of just working my way through. We might have to have you, but. Um, a uh, question or a few questions about probiotics and sort of, since this is your research focus, maybe you could tell us sort of practical things. I know you and I had spoken about how the research is still, you know, under underway. And um, I think we could have a whole other lecture. Maybe we will on <laughs> prebiotics and probiotics and what really, you know, is going on with the gut microbiome. But maybe you could just briefly um, kind of give us a taste of sort of what your practical approach is to patients who yeah. want to go on a probiotic. Yeah. So, um, just to kind of, for those that don't know what a probiotic is, and you're right, we probably could just do a whole another <laughs> lecture on this, but a probiotic is essentially a live microorganism that we take that benefits the host, which is us, ourselves. And these can be naturally found in foods, um, like yogurt, for instance, or even added to foods as well. Um, and when it comes to Parkinson's, you're right, it's very preliminary with potential benefits. There have been a few, um, I think it's one or two animal studies that have looked at certain probiotics for Parkinson's symptoms, um, but nothing really yet in humans, just because it's very hard to conduct it from a research standpoint and regulatory issues. But some practical tips would be, um, number one, if constipation is your biggest issue and you're considering a probiotic, I actually would recommend you consider increasing your fiber instead. I, when it comes to probiotics and constipation, it's really it's really hit or miss how effective it is. Um, most of the time, a miss. Activia yogurt is a yogurt out there with um, probiotics that could be helpful for constipation. Um, however, what they don't tell you on the label is that you have to eat two Activia yogurts a day to potentially improve your constipation symptoms. So really what I would say is if, if you're considering probiotics for constipation, I would actually switch you to, let's increase your fiber, whether that's from fiber supplements um, that have uh, prebiotic fiber, um, which kind of help fuel the bacteria in our gut. And then just in general, like fruits, vegetables, um, nuts and legumes, um, but there's other, there can be other health benefits to probiotic supplements. Some of the research that we did in our lab, um, we looked at stress and cold and flu symptoms because it's cold and flu season. Um, so there, but it can be very strain spe and species specific. So just because you might see a headline saying probiotics can be helpful for cold and flu symptoms, um, it really depends on the species that was studied in that research and how, and how effective that is. Um, so really trying to do a little bit more research there or just consulting with a doctor or a dietitian. Um, they might be able to help you uh, kind of figure out, is this the best probiotic for me in my needs? That's, that's good advice. A um, few questions on um, like other vitamins to supplement um, or other, you know, sort of any other supplements that you, you sort of advise. So you, let's say you're eating, you know, some, some diet that you, you can gather. It may not be all kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables. You know, the, the average American diet, I think has a lot of other, you know, not, not so Mediterranean components, but what would you say, you know, are, are reasonable places to start for somebody who wants to help supplement their diet with, you know, vitamins or other supplements? Yeah. So, um, in general, um, Unless you have a vitamin deficiency, I don't really recommend um, supplementing. But you know, maybe you don't, but you just want to take one anyways. What are some safe ones that I think and that could be beneficial, or maybe not? Um, I definitely I think there is um, by, like something to vitamin D. Um, I know a lot of people with Parkinson's are older, um, and they're probably not get, getting in the sun. As, as much and the sun, our skin's exposure to sun is really um, how we absorb a lot of vitamin D, not from our diet, but just like in general. And as we age, we know that that absorption is decreased and then we're out, outside less, now we're in colder months. 
Um, so if vitamin D is something that maybe your doctor has said that you're deficient or um, it's something that you've considered taking, we, uh, we know that um, 2,000 international units a day is, can, is a safe dosage just for, from a general perspective. And that's been studied from a safety perspective over a five-year period too. So um, if you're considering a vitamin D supplement, that's what I would recommend is um, 2,000 international units a day. Um, some other supplements you could consider, particularly if you don't eat enough fish in your diet. So when I think of eating enough, I uh, more so like three times a week eating fish would be omega-3 supplements. Omega-3s are a type of essential fat that is found in our diet. And that's good for brain function as well as inflammation too. And, um, and, mo oh, there's, and cardiac and heart function as well. Um, so when it comes to dosing for omega-3, um, often a lot of supplements on the shelves don't really have a lot of um, the specific uh, EPA and DHA, which are um, one of the two main um, omega-3 supplements that are studied in research. So in general, I, if someone is taking an omega-3 supplement, I recommend at least trying to get about a gram, one gram or a thousand milligrams or close to it of EPA um, and DHA combined. Um, and, that, and that's a generally safe recommendation too for, gen for most people. That sounds good. Um, there's a question or two about, um, you know, low carb diets, like keto, um, things like that as well. Um, could you comment on those? Carly? Yeah. So, um, there, there was like one group that, or, or a few groups that have looked at the ketogenic diet for Parkinson's, um, in general, they found that it might help improve non-motor symptoms, not necessarily motor symptoms. Um, it's really the benefits of the ketogenic diet with Parkinson's is still really preliminary. Um, but if it is something you're considering, I definitely would recommend working with your doctor or a dietitian who has, has um, a lot of practice with ketogenic diets because there can be a lot of um, adverse effects if it's not done properly, uh, particularly low blood sugar, um, const even constipation, <laughs> actually, um, and among others. Uh, but in general, maybe... Um, a lower carb diet um, is something that you're considering, but you don't want to go full blown keto necessarily. You can still um, eat higher amounts of healthy sources of fats um, and lower amounts of carbs from grains and really focus the majority of your carbohydrate foods um, from like leafy green vegetables, berries, et cetera, instead of like pastas and grains. Yeah. I agree completely about keto, consulting your, probably your primary care doctor and tell your neurologist as well, if you're going to even attempt anything like keto, I think um, it's quite dangerous. And I've seen patients really not do well on it. And then, you know, not even tell their family that they're on it and then, you know, sort of get confused or, you know, have, like you said, low blood sugar, or other things. So I think, you know, monitoring, making sure you're under, you know, medical supervision, if you're considering it, I don't personally see any benefits to it quite yet, you know? Yeah. Sure, and I will it. say too, you know, um, often we might see like online, like, oh, some keto recipes. Well, just because you're following maybe some keto recipes doesn't necessarily mean you're following a ketogenic diet. What that diet means is that you're raising the ketone, blood ketone levels, and you're really dramatically reducing the amount of carbohydrates and just really blood sugar um, that you're experiencing. And so really, when it's done right, people are actually monitoring their blood ketone and their blood sugar levels and working with that healthcare provider to make sure that they're doing it safely. So just because you find a recipe online that says keto friendly, it might not necessarily mean you're on uh, a ketogenic diet. It just might mean you're eating a high fat, low carb meal. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think you have to be quite careful. There's also some questions about things like flax seeds and chia seeds. Can you comment on those? Yeah, so um, flax seeds and chia seeds are a type of seed and um, they can be really easy ways to um, add more fiber into your diet. I know a lot of people like to add them to smoothies. Um, another benefit of them is that they can have a little bit more um, uh, healthy fats within it too, um, specifically alpha-linolenic alpha acid, which can be converted to omega-3s that we talked about. Um, the one thing that you, I will con 
consider with someone is that if you're someone that struggles with delayed stomach emptying, flax, flax seeds, but more so chia seeds, just because of how they gel, might um, delay the speed that your stomach empties. So if you have really poor appetite and you get full really quickly and you're uncomfortable, that might be a, a form of a seed that you might want to stay away from just because of how it functions when we digest it. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I, I think that I have seen that happen in some patients. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's more and more questions just coming in. It's a bit crazy. Um, so much, so much great information you're giving us, Carly. So um, another question about um, cherries and uric acid, like whether you should you know, avoid cherries with Parkinson's because it affects uric acid levels. Have you heard that? Uh, no, not particularly, no. Um, often when it comes to uric acid, we think about people who struggle with gout. Um, so if gout may be something that you have an issue with, uh, possibly. Um, but no, I wouldn't be concerned uh, with cherries and Parkinson's. Yeah, and they've done, I mean, there is some, there was some preliminary studies on the level of urate and, and then there was a study that looked at, you know, lowering that or changing that in some way. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a positive study. So I think um, if you like cherries, you can eat them, but I wouldn't eat them, you know, I think anything in moderation is probably okay. I wouldn't go crazy. You know, you meet these right. people eating grapefruits all day or something like that, probably. Exactly, like bringing it back to the variety aspect. Yeah, that's amazing. People are talking about also making sure that they're grinding the seeds to get the best um, benefits out of them. And, and there's been some chat a little bit um, about smoothies too. Do you recommend people using smoothies um, for uh, you know nutritional supplementation and even with swallow issues and stuff? Yeah, so I think smoothies um, can be a really great way, whether you need to, let's say, lose weight or um, gain weight too. Um, if you I work a lot with the people who have poor appetite issues. And when it comes to smoothies, in general, a liquid stays on our stomach pretty a lot less than if we were to eat a full meal. And it's a lot easier to kind of like pack a lot of um, nutrient dense foods and calories into a smoothie. And then vice versa, maybe you are someone that um, has weight management issues and you really want to maybe like lose a couple of pounds. Um, but just by adding like a protein powder and maybe um, water, or if you like almond milk or whatever type of milk or milk alternative you like, um, as like a form of a meal replacement, or even with some fruit too, can be a really great strategy for weight loss as well. Interesting. Wow. So I think this is the hour has literally flown by as we knew it would Carly. I think we were like talking about what, how to focus, you know, the time and stuff like that, but I'm glad you gave us you know, sort of a taste of everything. And then we could do sort of, we, we built on sort of the basics, which I think I, I know I need to hear again. I, there's never, you know, too much information about like just, you know, planning meals and especially in, in the middle of a pandemic, I think it's hard to eat. Right. So I think, you know, even though, you know, these are things that apply to all of us, um, you know, it's a good reminder, especially going into the holidays about how to eat. Um, so I, I really appreciate all of that. And and then, you know, we, we've sort of covered a lot of topics here with the question and answer. Uh, and maybe we could, you know, have you back and do just a session on understanding a little bit more about pre and probiotics and possibly talking about, you know, constipation strategies and things like that. So, so yeah. um, so appreciate your enthusiasm and all the great work that you're doing. It's exciting to have somebody do a PhD on this subject, which I think is really important. You know, I mean, getting the research behind, you know, all the theoretical, because I, I think we've as pointed out in the, the chat, there's a lot of people who say this is bad for you and that's bad for you. And this, you know, th and then next week it's something different and it gets very confusing and, and hard for patients to sort of be militant about these um, recommendations. So I think in general, what would be sort of your last sort of, um, you know, few sort of keeping it simple, you know, few yeah. few sort of, um, you know, sort of messages of hope and, and, and easing into the, the holiday season? Yeah, um, my last point would just be don't overcomplicate it. Don't get lost within the details. Just build that healthy plate like we talked about. But enjoy your holidays too and move on from it, right? <laughs> it's only a few days out of the year. Um, I'm not the food police. Eat your sweet potato casserole, your ham, your turkey. <laughs> but again, don't overcomplicate it. Let's just get more fruits and vegetables in our diet. Drink plenty of water, lean fruits of protein. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Carly, for spending the time. And I think we do sometimes spend a lot of time making these lists of things to avoid and 
people get so hung up in the details and I know that it stresses people out and it is hard. I think one of the things we talked about was access to healthy food. And yeah. even in a pandemic, you know, how are you supposed to get all these fresh fruits and vegetables if, you know, you can't get to the market or, you know, some of these options are not available and some people can't afford, you know, some of these things or can't access these things that there's not a healthy food store within five miles of their home. And they're literally buying food for some of my vets at the VA canteen or, you know, a liquor store sometimes. So how to, um, you know, sort of make these things accessible. So I think you've given us some great tips, some great options. And, and uh, thank you so much for the work that you do. I'm going to pass it back to Rebecca for our final uh, wave um, out. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. This is a really hot topic. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Carly. Thank you, Dr. Supermanian. So for those of you who don't have your cameras on, this is the time of our program where if you can lift the, uh, turn them back on and we're gonna give our wave goodbye. We love seeing your faces. Thank you for joining us and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.